We're returning this evening to Matthew chapter 6, and we read together verses 22 and 23. Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? And our subject this evening is great darkness within. It may sound a gloomy theme, but here the Lord Jesus Christ, as our creator, who knows the human heart through and through, and understands the weakness of our fallen nature and condition, is going to show us the problem. No one would be offended if they went to the doctor and the doctor told them the truth. We know we must know the reality of our malady before we will seek the remedy. Well, here the Lord Jesus Christ, under three pictures, is describing what is a deep fault or flaw in human character. Firstly, in verse 19 and 20 to 21, he speaks of misplaced priorities. Worshipping material things, setting our affection upon possessions and physical things here upon earth as opposed to God. That's the first flaw. We are so easily inclined to focus upon the things of this life, the here and now, the sensual pleasures, accumulating all that we can here below, but having no thought for our eternal destiny. Therefore, he says, Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. But secondly, verses 22 and 23 will be our text this evening. He speaks of the darkness within. We have light, but the light does not reach the soul. We'll look at that in more detail. And then thirdly, he speaks of divided loyalties. Verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That was a colloquial saying for material things. The money God. We touched on it a couple of weeks ago. But there's a common thread running through these three pictures. And that is a lack of single-mindedness and focus. This is our problem. We have a degree of light in our hearts. We have a conscience. There is an awareness of God. It's reinforced by uh, the evidences in creation, a designer, a mighty maker, whose wisdom, whose power is far beyond our comprehension. We know that there is a God, and yet we do not focus upon seeking him and finding him. The second picture here, the eye needs to be single focused upon one object rather than being distracted in all sorts of directions. That's the problem. And then thirdly, this divided loyalty. Are we for the Lord or are we for this life? 
and its pleasures and possessions. While we may have a little in our heart that is drawn to the Lord, we give him some sort of token, uh, allegiance, we give him a degree of worship, but our heart is divided. Partly for the Lord, mostly for the things of this life. Is that our condition this evening? It's ultimately the condition, the situation that we are all in until the Lord in his mercy and kindness draws us to himself. But we're going to focus this evening particularly upon this middle picture, the picture of flawed vision, darkness within. What is the picture then? The light of the body is the eye. Now we need to understand here that the Lord Jesus is not saying that the eye is a source of light. Not literally. He's giving us a physical picture. He's using the word light here of the eye in that the eye is the means by which light enters the person. Sight informs, it furnishes with an understanding and an awareness of our situation. Just as we have windows in a house, and as long as those windows are not obscured, when the sun rises in the morning, the light floods into the rooms, and everything is put in perspective. So it's through the eye that light enters, not physically into the body as such, but it furnishes us with an understanding. It's when our eye is clear, just as when the windows are clear in the house, that we can get our bearings. We can appreciate and value things correctly. We see things as they really are. We can avoid pitfalls. We gain a true panoramic vision of the situation that we find ourselves in. So that's the word here. The light of the body is the eye. It's like a lamp. It lets light in. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. The word single here in the Greek, it's the word from which botanists describe plants that have single leaves when they germinate. Wheat, barley, oats, grasses, they're called haploids. And that's the word here. It comes up as a one-leaf blade. Other plants, when they emerge from the ground, if you're a gardener, you will know you have two cotyledons, two leaves that come out of the seed. Or the brassicas, many of the flowers are like that. But here, the word single, it means one. It means if your eye is able to focus upon one object, if it sees clearly, if you've got two eyes and one is looking over here and the other one is looking over there, I won't ask the children to try that this evening, but you know what happens? It breeds confusion. Nothing is clear. There's no clarity. There's no perspective. In a sense, it's no better than darkness. It's just all a blur. And that's the, what the Lord here is describing. That's the physical picture. If we want to be safe and sound in our walk, in life generally, if we want to be able to put objects in their place and see what they really are, then we need both our eyes focused in a single direction. Single in that sense. That's the word here. But says the Lord, if thine eye be evil, malfunctioning, you could say almost diseased. There's something wrong with it. It's cross-eyed or blurred, unable to focus 
Then says the Lord here, your body shall be full of light. He doesn't mean that your eye lets light physically into your body, but in the natural world, if your, light, if your eye doesn't receive light onto its retina and then send accurate signals to the brain, then our perceptions are blurred. It's greatly debilitating. But of course the Lord here is using the picture to speak of spiritual things. He's speaking of the eye of the understanding, as Ephesians 1 verse 18 describes. He's speaking about light that must enter into the soul, not physical light, but truth. The word of God is light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, said David in Psalm 119. And the light of God's truth must come in to our soul in order to furnish us with clear perspectives on life. And this is the problem that we have as a result of the fall. The eyes of our understanding are like the eye that is distorted and blurred and crossed and therefore we do not grasp or perceive things clearly. We are distracted. We have half an eye to the Lord. Our conscience compels it. But most of our attention is upon earthly things. And that results in confusion within. When we are cross-eyed physically, we cannot perceive things as they really are. How much more when it comes to spiritual realities. We do not see eternal things. We do not grasp them. They are too far off. Well, this evening, why is it perhaps that some of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we're not laying up any treasure in heaven? We have no thought for being right with God, for having a name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, for being ready to die, to leave behind all in this world, it may happen at any moment. I didn't read the article, but there was a headline this week about a young man. He, he simply went to sleep and didn't wake up. No one knows why. If that was us, would we be, like, be leaving behind all our treasure because we have nothing in heaven? Why is it that people focus upon the here and now and become completely absorbed in mammon, the money god, material things? It's because their eye is not focused. They have no grasp, no perspective of eternity. Imagine a never, ever, ever ending existence beyond this world that's eternity and we shall spend eternity in one of two places the Lord Jesus Christ made this very clear we will either spend it with him in glory in that place prepared for them that have loved him and sought him and found peace and forgiveness through him unimaginable bliss for a never-ending era, or we shall spend eternity banished from the Lord and from all the comforts that only the Lord can give in a place that the Lord Jesus Christ describes as being where their worm dies not, the fire is not quenched. If we had even a small glimpse of the reality of those eternal things, then surely we should not lay up all our treasure here upon earth. We should say, my chief interest, my chief business must be to be right with God, that my soul may be safe and secure for all eternity. If we had any sight, any grasp 
of the justice of God. People don't think about the Lord. They have no realization, generally, of his majesty and his glory and his perfect knowledge of their life. And that record that will one day be laid out in the light of his holy laws and commandments, they have no sense of that. Their mind is darkened. They are wholly ignorant. No thought. Are we like that this evening? We push these things from our minds. Or the faithfulness and the kindness and grace of the Lord. If we conceived that to know Christ and to find him and to seek him would lead to never-ending bliss and even the, the comfort of the Lord and the help of the Lord now, should we not seek it? And is not the reason that we do not seek these things and call upon the Lord for his mercy and kindness to be shown to our soul? The fact that we never truly grasp them, we do not see them. A blurred understanding of things a double vision, at best, is what we have when it comes to spiritual things. We'll look at these words once again. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. If we focus upon the Lord and we seek him and call upon him. David, in Psalm 27, we read it earlier. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may see the beauty of the Lord in the sanctuary. Single vision, single focus. That was David. He says, you have said to me, seek ye my face, and my face I did seek. That's what is being called for here. But when we think about the needs of our soul for a moment a day, and then we focus most of our attention away from the Lord, then ultimately we are living in what can be described as as good as darkness. There may be a little light that's what verse 23 says. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? What is meant by this phrase? If therefore the light in thee. There is a little light that gets through. Even when a person has blurred vision or cross eyes, they see a little. And though man has fallen into sin and the whole of his nature has been corrupted as a result of Adam's disobedience there is a little light that gets through and it does inform us up to a point but what happens so often there is a God there's someone I must worship that's the voice of conscience but man makes up his own religions why are there so many religions in the world why is it that man generally is a worshipping being? He must worship something and someone. Why? The little light that is in us bears witness to the fact there is a creator. But so often that light is turned into darkness. The darkness of some idolatrous religion, some superstitious rituals, some uh, self afflicting pain and suffering that I administer to my body in the hope that it will atone for my sins. This is how the light in many people, what it results in. But here, the light that is in thee be darkness. How great is that darkness? Some look at this phrase and they say, the darkness is immense because 
the person's vision was crossed and they spent most of their time focused upon material things. And it darkens the mind. Covetousness, selfishness, it shapes the whole character. It leads to increased depravity and ignorance of the things of God. In the physical realm, when the light doesn't fall correctly, what confusion it leads to. And so, when materialism darkens the mind and distracts the focus and the attention, the realities of Christ and the eternal world are not perceived. They're wholly lost on us. Is that the trouble with some of us here this evening? The Lord gives this powerful picture. Is it a picture that accurately describes your condition, my friend, this evening? You're so focused upon earthly things that your vision is crossed. There's a half an eye or a tenth of an eye that tries to look about to the things of God, but your focus is here in this world. It's absorbed all of your attention and it's bred darkness within. Increasing darkness. As we go through life, if we say, well, I'm going to live for the here and now, I'm going to focus on these things, I'm going to take my fill of pleasures and possessions, everything that I can get my fill of, anything that money can buy that takes my fancy. If as young people we say, that's going to be my priority, there will be an increasing darkness that fills the mind. The things of heaven and Christ and the word of God, the teaching of the Bible, it will grow dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until ultimately we lose all sense of spiritual things. The mind darkened. That's the phrase that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 4. He speaks of the Gentiles whose foolish heart is darkened. It's a, it's a, a, a ruinous path to tread. Well, surely that must be the picture that we have here. But what does the Lord have in mind when he sets before us this situation? Surely, rather like a doctor, the doctor declares the condition in order to persuade us to receive and take the remedy. He knows that unless he can persuade some patients that there is a serious condition that is brewing, the person will say, well, the doctor told me I should get this and take this or the other, but I feel fine. I'll just carry on. I'm sure I'll be all right. Many people think like that when it comes to the needs of their soul. Well, I feel all right. I'm happy enough. I'm young. I've got life all mapped out. I'm going to have a good time. And they do not see their need. Friends, our need is this evening. Unless the Lord has dealt with us, is for our vision to be corrected. We need the optometrist in heaven to correct our vision such that we see clearly. In Psalm 119, King David said this, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We could use that same picture and borrow it and say in the light of the verse here, that we've read as a text. Oh Lord, I can see that there is so much confusion within, so much uncertainty. I don't see the issues of life as my conscience said, teaches that I should. Open my eyes, Lord. Correct my vision. Give me that single sense of things. Deliver me from all this 
lack of perspective in my soul. Open mine eyes. Christ is the light of the world. The light is there, but we need more than light, don't we? We need Christ to open our eyes such that the light of the glorious gospel should shine in our hearts. I just turn briefly to that passage we read in Corinthians. The analogy is a little different, but the sense is very similar. Verse 3, the Apostle Paul says, If our gospel be hid by our gospel, he means the gospel that he was preaching, it's the gospel of Christ, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Is the glory of Christ, is the preciousness of Christ hid from your mind this evening? You cannot appreciate him. You see no value in him. You can't wait for the service to be over so that you can pull out your phone and do something different or go home and plan the week ahead. The God of this world, Satan, he blinds the minds of them that believe not, such that the light of the glorious gospel doesn't shine within. The windows are closed, shuttered up, the curtains drawn in so many hearts. And who draws those curtains across the mind? It's Satan. He doesn't want us to see. Yes, the picture is slightly different. The Lord must deal with us. He must open our eyes. Then call upon him and say, Oh Lord, I sense that there is a God in heaven. I sense that eternity is real. And yet I cannot fully perceive it and grasp it. Give me clear sight. Give me perfect vision such that I understand these things. But there's another way in which the Lord is speaking to us here. Not only that the Lord himself must do something for us, and we must ask him. The Lord here is also implying that we are to address the issue. Look at verse 19 again. He says, lay not up. That's action. Something that we must do. Then look at verse 24. No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. The implication is there needs to be a choice made. We need to focus and say, now I see that heaven is far more important than earth. That God is worthy of my wholehearted seeking not the things of time and sense. He must move us. He must work within. But we are called to seek him out and set him first before our minds. Correct your vision, the Lord is saying, in a sense. You need to take off those spectacles because they are the wrong prescription Everything is blurred. You need to pick up the biblical spectacles. You need to see things as Christ teaches them. And then everything will become clear. Well, may the Lord bless these things to us this evening. What a tragedy. If inwardly there is just great darkness, we see not the needs that we have. We appreciate not the Savior who calls us. We're so embroiled and absorbed in earthly things that we do not focus upon eternal things and the needs of our soul. May the Lord open our eyes and move our hearts to seek him first. Notice what comes a little later. Verse 33 but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
Let me leave just this thought with you. The word first, foremost, above all else. Make that your single steady aim. Let both your eyes, all of your attention, be first and foremost upon the kingdom of God. I want to be a member of the kingdom of Christ. I want to know that my soul is safe and sound and secure. I have no righteousness of my own. I'm a lost and fallen sinner. I need the righteousness that God provides through his son's obedience to clothe my soul and to fit me for eternity. Seek this first. Get a single aim, a steady focus upon that, says Christ. And all these other things that you have need of shall be added unto you. Not always literally, but the joy and peace and satisfaction that you saw here, you will find in Christ himself. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, we thank thee for thy word. We recognize how pertinent these pictures are to our soul's condition by nature. We do focus and lay up treasures here upon earth, not in heaven. We have divided hearts that have so little for God, so much for the mammon of this world. Often our vision is blurred because we are not wholly focused upon those things that our soul needs. Draw near to us, correct our perspectives, and give us that single aim, that steady, cons constant desire to seek entrance to the kingdom and all its blessings, and to be found made righteous through the obedience of Christ and by his death at Calvary. We ask these things in his name. Amen. We close our worship this evening with hymn 385. Three.